you're familiar with this picture behind me. We live in a day, in an age of terrorism. We fight an enemy in a sense that's unseen, hidden in many cases. Uh, the war on terror, you think about this, you think about how that... Um, this is not like a normal war, where you know who the enemy is. In this war, the enemy is oftentimes hidden. Could be your next-door neighbor. You don't really know. Even this morning, you know, it's on the headlines every day. This morning there was uh, a terrorist uh, detonation in a school in Baghdad which killed 40 children. But we read about this almost every day. This morning, we're looking at a different kind of battle. It's a battle that's within. And yet, in some ways, it's... In some ways, it's like terrorism. It's a real battle that sometimes tears people apart. And it's a battle that's not maybe as obvious. You don't know the enemy. You're not as familiar with the enemy. And so, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but um, <clears throat> I believe that this struggle within can, in fact, be almost like this. You know, there are many skirmishes, and we can have various victories, but the enemy is never fully and finally completely defeated. That's true in the struggle that we face. So this morning, we want to look at this uh, second half of chapter 7, uh, what we've referred to as the being released from my inner struggle. How we can be released from the inner struggle. We're talking about this is a passage that applies to those who have been born again by the Spirit of God, and, uh, and yet we still face an inner struggle, oftentimes. And this is an interesting passage. Um, <clears throat> it has many interpretations. I think, actually, back a number of years ago when we were in the school, we had two different speakers on successive Sundays come, and very strange, they both chose to speak on this passage. And the one Sunday, it was one interpretation, and the next Sunday it was the other. And that's, in fact, uh, there, there are many people who struggled with this passage. You know, who is being spoken of in this passage? Is it unbelievers? Maybe it, some would argue that it's, this, this is clearly uh, being spoken to unbelievers when you look at some of the terms in here and the words. For example, the end of verse 14 of chapter 7, for I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. Well, who is the writer? Who is the Apostle Paul speaking of? Or maybe it's backsliders. Some would take it to be that. Some would argue, and one of the messages that we heard was many years ago at the school, was that this was Paul before he was a Christian. And the next Sunday we heard that, no, it's Paul who exists now. So there's various interpretations. Now, some would argue as well that this is the normal Christian walk. The struggle is described here. Or that it's a necessary uh, Christian experience. Well, Newell, in uh, his book on Romans, verse by verse, had this to say. He said it was of the ut ut utmost importance to see that the great struggle of the latter part of Romans 7 is neither a purely Jewish one, nor a normal Christian walk, nor a necessary Christian experience. And I believe that, in fact, it is uh, somewhat different than, th than these interpretations. First of all, I think it's a powerful word picture or an illustration of what can be, what, what the condition of many may be. Now, it is true that everyone, every born-again believer, faces this struggle in a measure. It's like a musician. A musician who is very talented and they're learning and studying music and they, their ear is being perfected and they, they get so they can sense and know every little mistake in a piece or of timing or of a note. And they become better and better 
as a musician, but they become more and more in tuned to maybe an error or something going wrong that we would even we would totally miss. And so it's like that, I think, in the Christian life as we go along. But this is not, as described here, the normal Christian experience. But in another sense, as we become more and more in tune with the Lord, the Spirit of God, then um, we are we we never completely leave that struggle because we could become more sensitive to the old nature and the, and the principle of sin within. It is the natural condition in the flesh. It's not an excuse. We might think of this as an excuse. Oh, well, hey, great evangelist Paul, he struggled with this, so, well, okay, tough. So I have the same struggle. It's not given to make us feel better. No, he struggled, so, well, it makes me feel better. I believe the main purpose of this passage is to show us that there is a better way. There truly is a better way. Let's read the passage from verse 15. For that which I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. So let's ask ourselves some questions. You know, does this passage apply to me personally? Does it apply to you? Does it apply to me? Do you ever feel this way about various situations that you encounter? And I'm sure that we could all answer in the affirmative to those questions. We do experience this struggle from time to time. And the question is, is there a way out? What is the way out of the struggle? Can I win this struggle? Can I win this struggle as described here? The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Can I win the struggle? And I would say most emphatically that you can't win the struggle. You can't win the struggle. I can't win the struggle. This is uh, crystal clear from this passage. We can't, in our own strength, win this struggle. It's impossible for you to win this battle within. So I want to look at this passage. Um, First of all, the source of the struggle, and then look at the solution. What is the solution? And in looking at the source, we look at, uh, on your outline, there's two principles, and it's a struggle between these two principles, and it's a struggle between two powers. So the two principles, the first one we find, is the law of sin in our members. For example, in 14b, uh, which we've already referred to, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. And looking down at verse 17, notice what it says. So, no, so now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. You know, that's not given for us to say, oh, well, it's not me that's doing it, so I don't need to worry about it. It's, you know, it's just 
It's just sin. It's just something I can't do, uh, deal with. And similar in verse 20. For, but if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. And 23, uh, the latter part. Notice what it says. And making me a prisoner of the law of sin. The law of sin. It's a, a principle. Now, if you were to look in 1 John, I'll just read a couple of verses here. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 9, we read about... <clears throat> uh, this is what it states. No one who is born of God practices sin. Just read the first half of the verse. Interesting. No one who is born of God practices sin. But then if you turn back a couple of chapters to verse one, chapter 1 and verse 8, we read that if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, hey, what's going on here? Seems to be a contradiction. If we say that we have no sin, then we're a liar. On the other hand, no one who is born of God practices sin. Well, how do we reconcile these truths. Well, you see, in the one, in chapter one, he's speaking about the many sins. In chapter three, he's speaking about the principle of sin, the one who practices sin, the one who is, uh, as a regular habit, is, is uh, caught up with the law of sin. It's similar to what we have in Romans seven. It's the principle of sin that's being referred to which some might say comes from our inner sin nature that he's, he's speaking about. Not necessarily the specific acts. The other principle that we read about is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus from chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. It's the law of God in the inner man in verse 20, 22 of our Pa uh, passage of chapter 7. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. This is something that's inner, not outward. The law of my mind in verse 23. So those are the two principles. There's a principle of uh, the, uh, the law of sin and we have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a picture of the Moor Cliffs in Western Ireland. I don't know whether you can see the uh, people at the top to get an idea of the height of these cliffs. There's uh, some, these small figures at the top. Those are people. Now, if you were an Irishman and you decided you wanted to come to uh, Canada and you thought, well, okay, hey, here I am at the westernmost part of Ireland. I'll just take a, a jump off here and make it to Canada. Well, there's a law that will prevent you from doing that. It's the law of gravity. And, uh, well, you know, you might say, well, hey, I need to jump further. So you get back and you take a big run. And you might get 10 feet further, but you're going to end up in the same place in the water. Or you might even get in your car and take a, you know, get zipping along there and off you go. And uh, gravity's going to get you. It's the law of gravity. It's a principle, just like the principle of the law of sin in a sense. Well, how could you get to North America? You know, there's another law that counters that law. It's the law of aerodynamics. And so you would find that you would get into an airplane and fly across the ocean. Now, you're not flying, in fact. You get into this airplane and uh, you're flown across. To be quite specific, you are flown across the Atlantic. You don't fly across. The pilot flies you across the Atlantic. Now, you're up in the plane. I mean, you can't fly. You don't usually see passengers up floating around in the plane, flying back and forth in their seats. Uh, but you're there in the plane. It's the law of aerodynamics. There's two laws. One counteracts the other. And so it is with these two laws in, the, in Romans chapter 7. The one uh, counteracts the other, in a sense. So the conclusion is, the law of sin inhabits 
and imprisons us. But the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free. Now, there's two powers at work. And see if you can guess what the first one is. I don't know whether you'll be able to guess this. Pretty difficult. Well, let's just read this again. See if we can guess what this is. For that which I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which indwells in me. And we could read on. 37 times over by my count. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Who's the, who's the first power? What's the first power? It's me. It's I. I myself and me, myself and I, as some would have said. We are the one, the first power. That uh, I am its source. And this is for the person who has stopped at Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. You have been justified by faith. You have been born again. But you experience the struggle. You've not gone on into the identification truths in the following chapters. One who is not clear on grace and law. One who struggles with acceptance. One who looks inward and not outward to another. To the other power. The one who is focused on me instead of on the source of real power. And of course, power number two is the Lord Jesus Christ, as we read in verse 25, where the conclusion here is, thanks to be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit, who has come to live in each uh, believer. So there's two powers uh, <clears throat> at work. It's either my ego, or it's God through the Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, through the Spirit. Now what's the solution to the struggle? And I would suggest to you it's a person and it's a promise. Um, <clears throat> there is a solution. It's a person, not a program. There's no program. There's no course that you can take. There's no book that you can read. There's no study helps that you can get for the solution to this problem. It's found in a person. And it's found in a promise from God's Word. And there is a solution. Who can set me free? Who will deliver me? That's what Paul asks. Who can deliver me from this inner struggle? And of course, the answer is plain in verse 25. It's the Lord Jesus Christ alone. He is the only one who can deliver me from the struggle. I can't. I can't deliver myself from the struggle. It's only he, through the Spirit, who can do so. And as we note here, thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, quickly moving on, what about the promise? I believe it's based on a promise. We read what Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We need to know the truth of God's Word we need to know the truth of his promise. His word is really a promise to us. And we've been looking at that in Romans chapter 6 already. 
we've been looking at those truths of our position in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is foundational to understanding how, what the solution is to this struggle that we face. And just briefly, in chapter 6, verse 6, there's something that we know. And the uh, knowing here in verse 6, as we've talked about before, is not uh, the normal knowing of something that you study and know. It's a knowing that only comes by revelation. It does not come by natural wisdom. There's two knowings in this chapter 6. This one is something that's by revelation only. There's a truth that we are to know, that we've been crucified with Christ and raised up into walk in newness of life. But there's also something to believe in verse 11. For even so, consider it to be true. There's no point in knowing something to know the truth. The truth sets you free, but you must believe it. You must accept it. You must really say, this is the truth. And this is what will set me free. And then thirdly, we find in verse 13, uh, do not go on presenting your members of your body to sin, and so on, down through there. We've looked at that before. I think in the King James it says uh, not to yield yourselves, yield yourselves to, go to God. So there's the knowing of these facts, of our position in Christ, that we, God sees us in the Lord Jesus Christ as dead and risen in Him and seated in heaven. We're to believe those things. The truth is no good if you don't believe it. And then yield to him. And there, you might say there's a fourth uh, <clears throat> promise in chapter 8, which we'll come to in the next few weeks. That is that we are enabled to walk in the Spirit. So now I, I'd like to uh, look at some diagrams to try and uh, explain this in a way. Uh, when we looked at the last half of chapter uh, 5, we had this diagram of this triangle trying to describe what man is really like. Body, soul, and spirit. And you could say that our body, and we won't be able to spend time on this, is flesh and bones and blood. Or you could say that our soul, our personality, and we talked about this several weeks ago as well, is made up of our intellect, our emotions, and our will. The spirit within is where our conscience lies. It's where, we might say, communion or worship. We worship in spirit and in truth. And it's intuition. We'll come back to that in a moment. But just think about this. Body, soul, and spirit. Now, the soul in the Greek is the word psyche. It's where the psychiatrists, that's what the psychiatrists and psychologists study. Your psyche, your soul. And uh, this list of almost three dozen aspects of the soul comes from uh, T. Austin Sparks, but I thought it was very interesting. Based upon, it's based upon desire, emotion, feeling, reason, argument, will, choice, determination. On the one hand, things like fear and grief and pity and curiosity and pride and pleasure and shame and surprise and love and regret and remorse and excitement. On the other hand, things like imagination, fancy, doubt, superstition, analysis, reasonings, investigations. These come from the soul. You could also look at things like desires for possessions, desires for knowledge, desires for power, desires for influence, and position and praise and liberty. These come from the soul. And determination, reliance, courage, independence, endurance, impulse, indecision, obstinacy. Very extensive list of things that we are very familiar with. These are what we would call soulish. Now, they're not all wrong. But by these things, we can see that we live in a world that is almost entirely a soul world. These are the things that drive our world. And when we speak of the soul, that's the part of us that interacts with the world. Now, the spirit, or the breath of God, 
And uh, that's described to us in the second chapter of Genesis when uh, God made man and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, that's his body, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that's the spirit of God, and man became a living being or a living soul. Conscience. Human conscience, we've been talking about this before as well, it's come up in earlier chapters in Romans, but it's fallible and not always right. We read about it, we read about the conscience that can be defiled or weak, or a seared conscience, an evil conscience, a foolish conscience, a, de- a deceived conscience. It can also be good or clear. Uh, this is speaking about the spirit of man, the place where our conscience is. Communion or worship. We commune with God, with God in spirit and in truth. We don't commune with God through our bodies. We don't commune with God through our soul. God is not soulish. God is spirit. And we commune with God through our spirit. Intuition. This has been described as um, the human spirit um, is the organ of spiritual knowledge. Spiritual intelligence by which all spiritual beings work. Think of angels. And they serve God by intuitive discernment of his will. Not by some argued and reasoned uh, conviction. And it's the Holy Spirit's revelation of spiritual knowledge to us. It's a new and divine faculty of knowledge and understanding. So we need to make this distinction between our soul and our spirit. Now, but going back to the diagram, the body and soul can be viewed as that which is the natural man. And the spirit, the part which is the spiritual man. The flesh and the spirit. The old man, the new man. That which is outward and that which is inward. I realize the soul is, in a sense, inward, but it's very closely linked to the body and to the uh, outward manifestation of who we are in our personality. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and in 14, uh, we read that, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. We can only understand spiritual truth through our spirit. We cannot understand spiritual truth through that which is natural, through the body and soul. Of course, that, that verse goes on to speak of the carnal or the, or the natural person and the spiritual person. And in 2 Corinthians 4 and 16, we read also that, Therefore do not, <clears throat> we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. The inner man, the spirit, would be the center, the core of our being. Another way of looking at this is that uh, the, the, the spirit is really the core of man's being. You know, the psychologists, when they're dealing with man and psychology and looking at, and some of you here know more about this than I do, but uh, when they ana- analyze this, they realize that there's some other aspect of, of the inner part of man that they describe in various terms, but they don't use the correct term uh, normally, the term being spirit. They realize that there's another aspect of man which is much deeper and, and centered, and it's the spirit of man. You see, man is designed by God. God, who is spirit, communes with man in his spirit. That was the intention before the fall. And so uh, the spirit rules, was dominant within the person. And, this, and the soul was under the spirit. The soul, the intellect, the emotions, and the will uh, were under the control of the spirit of man, which was directed and controlled and in communion with the spirit of God. And it was the, it's the, uh, and the soul then, the body communicates these spiritual truths to the world. A fallen man, that link with God was broken. And what happened is that gradually those soulish desires of man 
became stronger than the spirit of man. And so the soul really rules in fallen man. And that's why you see so many of these manifestations, those three dozen things that we saw earlier, some good and some evil, uh, that come forth and are evidenced through our body in the world. So there is a battle within. You know, the soul seeks supremacy over the man. And the soul and the natural man controls the spirit of man. The spirit is designed as the control center. The spirit, our man's spirit, is designed to control man through uh, God, who is spirit. Now, another way of uh, looking at this, and I like some of these diagrams, but uh, uh, this uh, oval-shaped uh, picture can be viewed as a mother's womb, say. And she's got two sons in her womb, and the one on the left is called Mr. Spirit, and the one on the right is called Mr. Soul. This is how I picture it, anyway. And Mr. Spirit's umbilical cord is connected to God, whereas Mr. Soul, he has a connection to the world. It doesn't quite fit the pattern here, but whatever. Um, and the intent was that Mr. Spirit would direct Mr. Soul in his interaction with the world. And Mr. Spirit was the strong man. And Mr. Soul was the weak man. What happened after the fall is that connection with God was broken, was shattered. And Mr. Spirit became weaker and weaker as time went on. And what happened? Mr. Soul gained strength. And as we showed in those other diagrams, Mr. Soul then was directing Mr. Spirit. And Mr. Soul became strong. And Mr. Soul was the one who was strongly connected to the world and interacted with the world. This is the struggle. This is the struggle that goes on within us. It's a struggle between these two. So after the, after the fall, the, the problem was that our spirit was the weak entity, did not control as God had designed. Now the man, after the new creation, when we are born again, we are made anew, God, that link with God is reconnected. We are made new creatures in Christ. But more than that, it's better than the original creation. Because in fact, God himself, in the, as the Holy Spirit, dwells within the born-again believer. So we're not just linked to God we have God within our spirit. God in our spirit. And so, Mr. Spirit on the left is much more strong, becomes, this is a process, just like with, uh, uh, in any situation, as, as we grow, Mr. Spirit, this is the natural progression, the spiritual progression, Mr. Spirit becomes stronger and sp stronger, and he directs Mr. Soul who has this link to the world. And it could be seen as maybe a bit of a dotted link. That's how I see the process. And that's how I see the struggle here. This is really the struggle. The solution to the struggle is recognizing these truths. Recognizing what's going on within. And then allowing the Spirit, God's Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, to work within our spirit and to control our lives through his spirit. Just in closing, you may recognize this person, Henry Morehouse, a, uh, a famous, uh, he's known as the young English evangelist, born in 1840. He's uh, famous or well known for the fact that he was the man who changed the man who changed the world. He came to America and he taught Dwight L. Moody how to preach the gospel. And, uh, of course, we know what the impact of D.L. Moody's ministry was around the world. This is Henry Morehouse 
who uh, uh, taught, basically as a young man, uh, taught D.L. Moody as a young man. Henry Morehouse was uh, feeling loaded down with the burdens of his ministry. And the Lord gave him a tender reminder of his care. When he came home one day, his young daughter, Minnie, whose legs were paralyzed, was sitting in her wheelchair. He was going to take a package upstairs to his wife when his daughter asked if she could carry it. Morehouse said, Minnie, dear, how can you possibly carry the package? You cannot even carry yourself. With a smile on her face, Minnie said, I know, Papa, but if you will give me the package, I will hold it while you carry me. And Morehouse saw this as a picture of his relationship to God and the burdens of the ministry he was carrying. Praise God, he could proceed with confidence knowing that the Lord was carrying him. This is the solution to the struggle, to recognize that it is the Lord who carries us. He's the one who takes us along. On your handout, on the back side, somewhere here I have a copy. I've just noted four points uh, as a, a way of application or encouragement for us. First of all, we need to realize, like Henry Morehouse's daughter, that you are crippled. In this case, spiritually. We are crippled spiritually. And we're to let the Lord carry you. He desires to be the pilot of your life. He desires to live in you and through you to enable you to accomplish his spiritual purposes. We've been going over and over these truths. These are fundamental. It's a promise that we need to believe that he will do. Secondly, you know, there is no need to continue to struggle in defeat. The inner war has been won by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the terrorist enemy within, your old natural self, has been defeated on the cross. He, Christ has won the victory. And all we need to do is count on him to make it true in our own daily experience. This is a continuing thing. You know, we enter by faith, not by works. But we also read three times over in the scriptures, the just shall live by faith. We sang a chorus about that. We live a life of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who carries us. It is his spirit who ministers within us. Thirdly, the secret to spiritual growth is the realization that all true progress is found only in one person. The Lord Jesus Christ who indwells you through the Holy Spirit. And the key is knowing the truth about your position in him, believing that it is true, and giving yourself unreservedly to him. Now, this is a continuous moment-by-moment -moment process throughout the entire length of our lives. And fourth, like a blessed musician, progressively learn to tune your heart to hear his voice and to respond to his direction in the symphony of your life. Our great conductor's greatest desire for you is that you will allow him to enable you to bless others through your life. The only blessing comes when it's accomplished through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the cross of Calvary. It does not come from me. That's the struggle. When we, when we put ourselves in the picture, as we see in this chapter, we're setting ourselves up for defeat. When Christ is the one who is preeminent in our life, when he is the pilot of our life, when he is the one who carries us along, when he is the one who tunes our, our hearts and our minds and our thoughts and our will to his voice and his word, then indeed he will be able to work in us and through us. May God enable us to do so.